His friends wondered how this was possible. Did he really love her at all? Was he secretly even glad that she died? Then they got the clue. While talking about her, he always held a hamster, his dead wife's favorite pet object, gently playing with it. This hamster was his fetish, a living disavowal of her death, enabling him to rationally accept that she is dead while suspending what Levi-Strauss called efficacité symbolique, the symbolic efficiency of this fact. The proof, a year after his wife's death, the hamster also died, and the effect of this second death was devastating. The widowed husband immediately suffered a total break breakdown, had to be hospitalized after repeated suicide attempts. In this precise sense, money is also for Marx a fetish. I pretend to be a rational utilitarian subject, well aware how things truly stand, but I embody my disavowed belief in the money fetish. So when we are bombarded by claims that in our post-ideological cynical era, nobody believes in the proclaimed ideals, or when we encounter a person who claims he is cured of any beliefs, he accepts reality the way it really is, he said usually it's all about pleasure, money, I don't have any illusions, you should always ask the question, okay, but where is your hamster? That is to say, where is the fetish which enables you to pretend to accept reality the way it is? I claim that what I ironically refer to as Western Buddhism, this popularized version of transcendental meditation, oriental spirituality, is such a fetish. It enables you to fully participate in the capitalist game while sustaining the perception that you are not really in it, that you are well aware how worthless the spectacle is. What really matters is the peace of your inner self to which you can always withdraw and so on and so on. Now let me go a couple of steps, make a couple of steps further. Of course, one should note that fetish can function in two opposite ways. Either its role remains unconscious, as in the case of the unfortunate husband, who was unaware of the fetish role of the hamster, or you think that fetish is that which really matters, as is the case of the Western Buddhist, unaware that the truth of his existence is the social involvement, which he tends to dismiss as, oh, it's only a social game, and so on and so on. But even more important is to introduce another distinction between two different modes of fetishism. First, we have what I described now, this, let's call it, permissive cynical fetishism. You are cynical, you know how things are, but you cling to your fetish, which allows you to maintain a distance towards a reality. It should be opposed to, let's call, call it populist fascist fetishism, where exactly, precisely we encounter anti-Semitism. Let me explain this difference by opposing, again, two types of ideological mystification. The first type would have been that of false universality. This is the standard critique of ideology. For example, you advocate, you say to your liberal friend, you advocate freedom, equality, and so on, but you are not aware of implicit qualifications which in their very form undermine what you are officially for. For example, your definition of equality secretly privileges rich, male, belonging to a certain race, culture, and so on, and so on. That's the standard critique of ideology. The reproach is false universality. You claim your, your value, your, your motive is really universal. You know this classical Marxist point, bourgeois equality is really the equality for those who, for a limited part of society. But there is another mystification, which would be the fetishist properly mystification as it is operative in anti-Semitism. This mystification proceeds in a different way. It concerns the false identification of the antagonism and of the enemy. As we all know, class struggle or another social antagonism is displaced onto the struggle against the Jews so that the popular rage at being exploited is redirected from capitalist relations as such to the Jewish 
plot. So, to put it in very naive terms, in the first case, the liberal guy who argues for universal freedom, equality, and so on, you can say when the subject says freedom and equality, he really means only freedom of trade, equality in front of the law, and so on and so on. In the second case, fascist antisemitism, you can say when the subject says Jews are the cause of our misery, he really means big capital is the cause of our misery. But the asymmetry is clear. To put it again in naive terms, in the first case, I use this terms with all qualifications, very naively, of course. The good explicit content, freedom, equality, covers up the bad implicit content, class and other privileges and exclusions. We don't reproach a liberal for being for equality. We reproach him that the way, he, that the way his notion of equality is secretly qualified makes it inconsistent with itself. But in the second case, the bad explicit content, anti-Semitism, covers up the good implicit content, hatred of exploitation, and so on and so on. So you notice, I know this is very naive, but I think there is something to it. This, we are like In the first case, the good cover, explicit, has a bad secret behind. Here it's as if the cover is bad, hatred of the Jews, and so on, but allegedly there is a good content behind. Like, as we usually say, workers have the right to be furious at exploitation. They just direct it at the wrong target. So as we can clearly see, the inner structure of these two mystifications is, again, that of the couple symptom fetish. The implicit limitations are the symptoms of liberal egalitarianism, singular returns of the repressed truth. While Jew is the fetish of anti-Semitic fascists. As it were, you know how Freud defines the fetish. The last thing you see before you see that woman doesn't have a penis. Here, the Jew would have been the last thing you see before confronting, let's say, class struggle openly. This asymmetry has crucial consequences for the critical process of demystification. Apropos liberal egalitarianism, the interpretive demystification is relatively, relatively easy, since you can directly mobilize the tension between form and content. You argue with the liberal democrat, listen, but don't you see that your notion of equality is really secretly qualified? And to be consequent, your liberal friend, maybe, uh, We'll have to admit that the content of his ideological premises effectively belies its form. And then he can do one of the two things, either move a little bit towards, he can then, okay, have, he has many options in the space of what Badiou yesterday so nicely defined as this space of paraconsistency and so on. He can say, yes, in principle, in the long term, but we have to be realists. If we do it immediately, we will ruin it. Or he can adopt a pure cynical position. He can say, listen, this is an illusion, equality, but for society to function, we need these illusions, whatever, whatever. But what I'm arguing is that in the case of Jew as the fascist fetish, Paradoxically, the interpretive demystification is much more difficult. It, this confirms also the clinical insight, incidentally, that a fetishist, it is almost impossible through interpretation to undermine a fetishist. You can have not always some success by interpreting hysterical neurotic symptoms. Their interpretation can work, not with a fetish. In practical political terms, the conclusion is pretty sad. It is that it is very difficult to enlighten an exploited worker who blames Jews for his misery. You know, explaining to him, like, can't you see how Jew is the wrong enemy? How your true enemy is the ruling class?